Welcome to Crypto Disrupted, a cryptocurrency and blockchain podcast with your hosts, Trent Lipinski and Greg Kerr. All right. Well, hey, welcome back to Crypto Disrupted. We're here with a special guest, Melissa Quinn, all the way from Vancouver, Canada, which is turning out to be a, a tech hub and it's a real big environmental hub. And I'm kind of learning this, you know, a lot of money, wealth, tech, and people that are interested in the environment and social impact issues coming out of uh, Vancouver. So Melissa, welcome. Thanks for coming onto the show and give us some background on who you are and what projects you're working on. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's, it's great to hear people say things about Vancouver other than that it's so rainy. So that's nice. Because <laughs> that's a true stereotype. Um, awesome. So my name is Melissa Quinn. I am the corporate development manager at a project called BrightMesh. Um, I'm also the director for Canada of the Blockchain Users Group. So BrightMesh is, uh, we've got a big part of the research and development team here in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, we are a Swiss-based company. And uh, do have some growing teams in Singapore, as well as a development team out of Bangladesh as well. And what we're really focused on is kind of you touched on it already is changing the world and making our mark in a way that has a positive social impact to the most people possible. And so for us, we're building a software based mobile mesh networking platform and protocol. And what that is essentially is just enabling people to connect and transact on a direct peer to peer basis. So a lot of times you hear of these decentralized and distributed and peer-to-peer -peer solutions, but people forget the fact that that's still relying on centralized ISPs or other authorities that can kind of make that transaction happen or that connection happen. Um, and for us, what we've been able to do is put that solution, that software-based solution onto mobile devices, IoT devices, um, Android primarily right now, but uh, other devices in the future and enable that connectivity using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi direct on a peer-to-peer -peer way. And so, um, it's really taking away that centralization and reliance as heavily on ISPs and traditional infrastructure. And, and that's it seems quite technical, but when you think of it from that humanistic perspective and you think of the power that that can have in things like natural disasters or when there's political unrest or um, censorship, when abolishment of net neutrality comes up in conversations, all those types of things that can really empower those people in a way that they can connect still um, in localized ways. So. That's right. So, so basically the, the idea is like, just like machines or, or devices can communicate for through airdrop, uh, that type of connectivity without the internet, you're talking about having these devices communicate with each other and then basically daisy chain around to create a new internet without a server where, you know, Google's maintaining it or, you know, an ISP provider or an internet service provider is pushing out the internet it's kind of the people that are creating the computing power of the internet. Exactly. Yeah. I like to say it's infrastructureless infrastructure. So <laughs> it's not, right. <laughs> we don't use the internet. Um, that's complementary when there's other things uh, like Facebook solutions or Google solutions to bring connectivity to places that don't have it. That's great. And that's all complementary. But what we can do is kind of like you touched on with airdrop, you can connect in um, the vicinity of the devices around or within the vicinity of the devices around you. Um, and connect in that peer-to-peer -peer way, but rather than just relying on, say, Bluetooth or creating a hotspot, we can use Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi Direct all simultaneously. And then when you start to string those connections together and you can create um, more of a dense mesh network, because it's all happening simultaneously, you can really create um, a localized solution around you. So that's when you really start to take away the power of the ISPs, because that's when that infrastructureless infrastructure comes in, right? The more people are connected around you, the more you can rely on those different technologies to connect in that peer-to-peer -peer way. And then there's a recent example. I was in Egypt for the revolution, and it was interesting because one of these political theory dynamics is that all regimes bring themselves down. And Mubarak did that, you know, as Tahrir Square was filling up, people were revolting, and then he shut off the internet. And so they started uh, beaming the internet in from Algeria, uh, or Libya into uh, Egypt and then it kind of just it, it worsened the situation for the political parties you know <laughs> and, and they continued to use the internet and then that was one of those kind of like uh, causes bell eyes for the crowd to say hey look they're trying to oppress us they're trying to shut off our access to information so I like it you guys are taking this angle too that hey in those scenarios you can quickly uh, skirt 
to the government and continue to share information laterally. So, yeah, maybe there's not yeah. a question in that, but yeah, there's a there's a <laughs> modern uh, <laughs> uh, no, but there's, for there's where really, Yeah, we we heard today that China was banning the letter N, and if they can't control social media, their next step is to work on shutting down the internet. Or I haven't read it in full, but little cases like that, and you're like, okay, this is serious. We need to we need to take action and empower the people to connect because the power of connectivity is huge and, and it's not, it's a, it's a human right. In fact, since I think 2015, the United Nations team did a human right. And so for governments or centralized authorities to be able to just take that down isn't necessarily fair. Yeah. yeah. One of the really fascinating things is, you know, the hardware to be able to do this has existed the entire time. So we're literally just talking about software um, because the, every smartphone that's ever been created from the first iPhone to every Android device to every iMac, multicolored iMac created, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s with a Wi-Fi card in it has the ability to create a mesh network. So I, I remember even when I was a kid, you know, hacking my, my iMac, I, you know, I was running some software to be able to send and receive signals with my Wi-Fi card. Uh, and I was able to basically use it to be able to see all the other networks around me uh, and I was basically sniffing packets out of the air from other people's Wi-Fi networks. Um, that's a little more difficult to do today because they've they've literally created software to lock those functionality and those features down. Uh, because companies like AT and T and you know the the wireless carriers and the internet service providers they don't want you doing this um, because this essentially replaces them to some extent. I mean, take the city of San Francisco or even Vancouver for example. You know, you could literally have one high bandwidth internet connection that could just be shared across an entire city because there's enough, enough proximity between all the different devices that those signals can be, that one internet connection could, you know, serve thousands of people because ultimately, you know, most of those people are just simply interacting with each other anyways. It doesn't really make sense that, you know, to talk to my neighbor next door a signal is being sent to some server like in another state in Nevada or something and then is being bounced to Nevada and then back to California so that I can talk to my next door neighbor when our devices are within range of each other. Yeah, it's, it's super energy inefficient as well when you look at it from that perspective. Um, we actually did that with, uh, we're doing a pilot project up in um, northern, Rigolette, or Nor northern Labrador, a community called Rigolette, and it's a community of 300 people. Um, that only had one internet connection. And so they weren't able to connect basically after 10 a.m. and before 10 p.m. because of that bandwidth was just so oversaturated in that small community. So what we've done is we've partnered with um, the University of Guelph and there's a bunch of students working on applications there that are gonna be mesh enabled so we can go and connect that community and allow them to connect kind of throughout the day in a much more meaningful and energy efficient way as well. And the big issue for them was um, adapting to climate change because they, without connectivity, they wouldn't, be able to share, say, a photo that they took of water melting or crops of what time they are blooming at or whatever the case is. Um, they weren't able to share that in a meaningful way and, and share that data and analyze it together. And so the university is creating the application and we're going in and supporting the mesh enabling of that and so that the whole community can connect. And that's only 300 people. And so you look at a place where there's density, be it San Francisco, Dhaka, Bangladesh, where other offices, it's it's huge, and you get one application that is mesh enabled, and you've got density of nodes that can support that peer to peer connectivity. Oh, nice! I want to see how that works out. And uh, I was going to say, so something that's like obvious when you first go onto your website is that it's people focused. I really really grabbed my attention that there's a lot of people. It's a tech website, and it's all about people. <laughs> and can you talk about the? the genesis of the idea, how did the team come together and say, hey, this is how we want to like impact the world? Just, I, I want to know how that connection was made in that way. Yeah, so it, it started, our team in Bangladesh, like I said, we have about 70 of them now um, doing it primarily app development over there. Um, I say 70, it's probably 75 tomorrow. They're growing so fast. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been working with them since the company started, the parent company, in 2010. And the parent company has always been interested in innovative tech and it kind of does different things. So the other side of the business is um, travel, travel tech and ad tech. Um, 
building websites, creating a business off of that, uh, primarily domain names um, was where the, the businesses started from. Um, and when we were working with the team in Bangladesh, they shut down the office to Skype call Canada. What, what we found out later, <laughs> we didn't know this at the time because the bandwidth just wasn't um, possible to do all those things at once. And so they started to build an application so that they could share files and messages back and forth at, within the office without having to um, stop the Skype call or, mm. or affect that. And they showed us afterwards and we said, guys, this is incredible. Like this could solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. And for us, it was really about solving that pain point. And that's where that came from. Um, they were solving their pain point and we realized that there's so many other people that could benefit from that as well. And so that application was called Yo. It's had about a million downloads. It's still popular in places like Cuba, El Salvador, Bangladesh um, for about three years it's it's been out for um but it just wasn't scaling quite the same way we'd expected and so we took that as an opportunity to do a lot of in-depth market research and figure out what people were using it for and how can we get that to scale and they said well that's it's great but like why would i share my internet connection with someone i don't necessarily know and like i said it's it's good in places like cuba they're using it in hospitals to share images back and forth and things like that but that's in an environment where they know each other so how can we incentivize them to share their connectivity with people that they don't necessarily know. And so we realized that that's where the, the incentivization piece such as tokenization comes in. We can incentivize them to share their, their bandwidth, data, internet um, with people that they don't necessarily know and get compensated for that and create kind of um, a new type of entrepreneur, really a digital entrepreneur out of all these people. And then when you start to think of those impacts on society as a whole, you realize that giving connectivity to 3.9 billion people who are unconnected can create a whole bunch of value for um, their where they're living, their life circumstances, everything. And so for us, it was really about, like you said, those people and the power that we can have to make a social impact um, in a, a whole bunch of places. Yeah, I noticed that you have uh, an Ericsson report about mobile connectivity access to, you know, throughout Asia or something like that. And I was just like, okay, yeah. So it's mapping out this kind of path to your solution and say, all right, we have this. And I didn't know about the, uh, the connectivity issue you had with, you know, your remote office. So your connectivity issues and you're going after like people that, that are having difficult connecting and you see like, okay, if we look at the world through a lens of value, and value creation, how can we break those barriers down? And you're saying, okay, just by having, you know, or sharing your computing power, you can start creating value for other people. And as we, you know, we're going down this road too, to kind of say, hey, how do we create systems that are attainable to the most people? And if everybody has a device and everybody can create value by sharing the computing power of that device, then you're now allowing or make a very easy path to value creation. We start looking about a basic human income. You know, there, there's one layer of it, right? Uh, one of the projects we're working on, we feel like we've kind of monetized the digestive tract because we can turn waste into energy. And then here's another way that people can have access to value. And we see that as the largest kind of like bridge that we can build for the most human beings as well. Um, so yeah, so have you guys, as you look at uh, the social impact of your thing, of your, your, your entire system, you know, what kind of measures do you have on impact, you know, on your people, planet, profit model? Like, are there any kind of like goals or um, kind of indicators you hope to, to reach? Yeah, it's a good question. So we're actually a B Corp. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those at all. It's, I like to say it's what organic is to food, B Corp is to business. So you go through a rigorous process to get certified as a B Corp. Um, and then it changes, it goes through everything from changing your articles of incorporation to kind of setting out um, goals for you in a sense. So you can see you do like a, I think it's 200 question survey and then you have to do an interview and all sorts of stuff. And it looks at um, your consumers, your governance models, your employees, your environment, and your community, I think. And you get um, scored based on all those and only you have to meet the minimum requirements in order to become B Corp certified, which we did. And that was really important for the business because we do keep track of all these things, but there was no measure to say, yeah, there's a third party that's recognizing this and acknowledging that we are trying to do things in the best way for people, planet, profit, 
Um, and so that to us was a really important factor. And we've taken that and been able to look at the areas where we were um, kind of lacking on. One of them is environment and it's primarily because we rent, rent the building we're in, right? Or we lease it. So how do you change the light bulbs to be energy efficient if you don't own the building kind of thing? So nonetheless, there's areas for opportunities there. So for us, that's our way though to, um, to take that data and, and improve on it and constantly be setting those goals for improvement. You have to recertify every two years. So it really keeps you on top of it. And, and to us, that's a really important way to, to measure the good that we're doing in the world and, and be able to be proud of that. You know, I, I, I see that, uh, okay, so there's a recertification to be an impact business and that keeps you on your, you know, you're minding your P's and Q's. You know, I'm always looking for sometimes even like um, negative impacts of success where it's like, hmm, will conflict arise? Will governments topple? You know, as information is starting to kind of uh, proliferate at the lower levels without a filter of the government, you know, and... I think too, one of my indicators that blockchain are, is, is operating is going to be a shift in identity away from the nation state. So I think our national governments may suffer a little bit as people start solving problems on their own and then sharing them laterally, like your technology is proliferating. So you'll, you'll relate less to this, your capital city as they're localized, your problem solving and your data sharing. And so, you know, and I think, you know, down the road, as I walk my head down this, I'm sitting there, well, national militaries might become obsolescent, you know, and then, you know, you're seeing less and less conflict because more and more problems are being solved at local levels and less you know, like negative interaction between populations, less population movement, uh, better administration of resources. You know, these are the things that I think your technology is going to really impact. And it may not be direct. You may not get that direct credit to say, oh, we got mesh network in here, unless you measure it, I guess. Too. And, you know, we stopped fighting. You know, this area got less fighty <laughs> as basic needs were, cre you know, were cared for through this mechanism. Um, so, no, it's an it's interesting. Kind of for us. Oh, sorry. No, go, go, go. go. Um, about having the SDK and having the SDK be freely available to developers was because when we did start down this road, everyone had a use case for mesh networking that was amazing. And how do you say one's better than the other, right? Especially when they know that we're such a values driven company, they come to us with the really admirable solutions. And how do you say no to that? You can't, right? And so we thought, okay, we can't be everything to everyone. We can't win in every way, right? How do we give it give out our technology in a way that we can empower other people to make those localized solutions and make an impact in their direct area, be it Rigolette where there's only 300 people or in a place like DECA where they have an, an insane population of really dense needs, right? Um, and so for us, the SDK was what was exciting about that. We could give out that SDK as, as a free tool for developers to then mesh enable any application that they have. And that's when you get, like you said, those those localized solutions that can be spread on a more horizontal level ra rather than relying on us to create those solutions for other people and us trying to guess what people need, right? We can just empower people and enable them to create the solutions that are most meaningful. Are you seeing any like trends or specific, like really interesting use cases, like things you guys didn't even predict? Um, have you seen anything like that? There's a, there's a few. Yeah. We do try and do as many hackathons as we can and support um, hackathons. The, the one that um, comes to mind was our team in Bangladesh actually created a solution so that um, when you're going to the doctor's office, you could have the application um, tell you when you're in line basically, because there, there's such long lineups, but if you leave, you lose your spot. And so people will be sitting there all day and can't necessarily go and do other things or need to miss work or whatever that, situation is for them in their unique experience um and that's something that we wouldn't really consider here right we make an appointment at the doctor and we go and so all those things that are very um impactful in those local areas like you said are things that we couldn't have predicted i don't think and yet can have an amazing impact and can you kind of go into like how you guys are using the blockchain and what how the blockchain is kind of playing a role in you know, your, your token economy, your, how it interacts with your software is, can you kind of go into that a little bit? For sure. Yeah. So I touched on it a little bit earlier. It was all about for us being able to incentivize the users in the mesh network because density is key. And we, we 
we've seen that time and time again in mesh networking. And so for us, it was, there was two problems, incentivization and identifying nodes in the mesh network, not for our purposes, not for data collection, but more um, data collection about the mesh network in general. So we could see, great, it looks like there's a mesh network in Ontario that has 20 nodes and here's where it's dropping off and here's where it's not. We actually have a simulator out that uh, someone shared an article about if, if you see that on Medium. Um, but so for those two problems, the, the tokenization and the transactions through the Ethereum blockchain whereby you could do trustless transactions and, and it was um, perfect for a peer-to-peer -peer situation. Um, that solved the incentivization piece. It was, it was a perfect storm really. And then the identification piece, it actually came first um, because you can't have a traditional IP address when there's no internet and mesh network. Um, we realized we could generate an Ethereum wallet ID on every node that is in the mesh network. And so that for us, again, kind of coupled exactly with um, smart contracts and the possibility to do transactions in that way. Uh, so yeah, so the, the blockchain use in the right mesh um, protocol and platform was really key for two reasons for us, the incentivization and the identification layers. So at first, um, we realized that we couldn't identify nodes in the mesh network with a traditional IP address because there wasn't internet in these mesh networks, of course. Um, but we could identify them with by generating an Ethereum wallet ID on each one of these nodes. And so with that, we started to look more into Ethereum and the use cases and the possibilities of that as well and realized that we could enable and encourage transactions in a way that is trustless and peer-to-peer and much more conducive to right mesh and mesh networking than it would be to say, try and incorporate something like PayPal or another solution so people can transact. Um, at which, as well, you could go into so many things, this is where the blockchain is beautiful, it's, it's global, it's, it's perfect for this. Um, and so that really enabled us to kind of solve those two problems with, with Ethereum and the blockchain. Um, and we've, we've created it in a way so that the network stack can can adjust if it needs to be, be create a different blockchain. Um, we created or we ported um, micro Raiden into Java so the team can do um, more micro payments as well off, off chain without clogging up the network, which has been amazing. Um, the team's done some, some great work there, but all those different things that you're adapting to daily, it seems as things change and progress, but um, it's been it's been an amazing opportunity for the team to kind of solve some of those problems with the blockchain and the cryptocurrency industry behind it because they are so supportive and and the nature of mobile mesh networking that is kind of resistant to censorship and centralization is key to the blockchain and the crypto community. So it's kind of like we found our people finally. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is a quick indicator of like where people are in their path on understanding the tech is to see, you know, where they're seeing the solutions. And what yesterday we were talking about how um, some people are just recreating old systems in a digital way. And mm -hmm. then some people are really changing things because they have this like greater understanding of how the tech can be applied. And then that's where you're seeing the major change. And I think your company is one of those examples where you're like, you can see the future through your company and through your process. So it's been interesting. It's really exciting. I find like we joined the um, Blockchain for Social Impact Coalition. It's powered by consensus, but it's a group of, I think I counted 40 that, companies today, but I don't know if that's the total number, but um, all companies that are working towards social, positive social impact goals using blockchain technology. And the thing that I'm so passionate about RightMesh is that a lot of these people have really admirable solutions, be it solving identity issues with the blockchain or banking the unbanked, all these things that we hear about, which are amazing and, and necessary for sure. But the elephant in the room is that no one talks about that there's still those 3.9 billion people who don't have connectivity. So how do you bank the unbanked if someone doesn't have a phone they, or connectivity? They may have the smartphone, but do they have to walk seven miles to connect it to the internet? Or how does, where's that bridge being gap, gap being bridged? Um, and so for us, what's really exciting is that we can go and, and empower those applications to reach those subset of consumers who aren't online. And I think that's where you really start to collaborate in this space and, and make a huge impact. And being part of things like those coalitions and working groups are, are an amazing opportunity. We, we just created, well, we didn't create, but a few groups in the mesh networking space founded the um, Universal Connectivity Alliance. And it's all about bringing the different aspects of K mesh networking or other kind of 
connectivity solutions and bringing them all together and saying, okay, here's the goal that we have. How can we collaborate and support each other? Because there is kind of like you touched on earlier, Trent, there's the hardware solutions, there's Wi-Fi extenders, say, and all these different things. And, and for us, it was about creating a solution that was more inclusive so that someone in, say, an emerging market didn't have to go buy that hardware or didn't have to kind of fit into that one bucket solution. So how can we work together to kind of pile, compile all the mesh networking solutions and make an even better opportunity for connectivity? Uh, yeah, I, so I've built an electric grid in this one village. It sits five hours from a paved road. And we can, it's amazing, we can get internet there but you have to go in front of a certain place on the edge of the village and stand in a ditch and right there you can get it. <laughs> yeah. And so when, you know, and that was great to have that in my mind and that's that good experience as I went through your white paper and stuff like that to kind of see and, and time travel forward in that village to see how they're going to react to something like this and how the, the computing power can be handled and how like, they will they'll be unaffected by even a nuclear exchange. You know, if an ISP goes completely mm -hmm. off the, the planet Earth, you know, this village still, psh, whatever, you know, they'll read about it <laughs> because they can <laughs> they stay uh, connected. Yeah, but, uh, and it's exciting. Like, we've all experienced that through travels, but even I think, like, when I go down to the States in a very developed world, right? I go down to the States and my data plan is super expensive. So I like huddle around the Starbucks for free Wi-Fi and try and connect that way just to send a message back home, right? And like those things that even we experience here and you put that in a situation in an emerging market, it's it's crazy powerful. No, yeah, I traveled through Texas and it was in a rural part of Texas, couldn't find the internet. <laughs> Like what you know like and you're like okay yeah there's dead zones you know and there's a lot of bad side effects when people don't have access to information no absolutely yeah yeah definitely so okay so uh is there anything what's next for you guys so you're you're about to head out of uh canada right you're heading over to africa yes uh, what are the next steps for what you guys are doing we're at a super exciting time so we started our um our token generation event early january we started a private pre-sale um which closed out a hard cap of 18 million in less than a week so that was really exciting um we just finished our public pre-sale that sold out in eight minutes and now we're gearing up to our public crowd contribution which will be march 27th and for us that's the final the final token generation event um and that's when we get to start the really exciting stuff chris our fun founder always says we have this really interesting path where we've been kind of as a company gearing up for the last seven, eight years, we have this mild inconvenience of a token generation event and kind of the in-between. And then we've got 10 years of changing the world ahead of us. And so coming to the end of this period is where it's going to be really exciting to start making those really meaningful partnerships, which we've got a few in the pipeline and, and really start to work on that fun stuff and have the manpower to, to make an impact. Oh uh, yeah, I've heard, uh, spoken like a true idealist, right? His mind <laughs> there. This money thing's in my way. Get let's get that money <laughs> thing over with, and then start making real change. No, I love it. That's amazing. Um, yeah, wh wh where do you see yourself? Like, uh, how do you see your progression? You know, as this starts taking off. That's a good question. I've been so focused on uh, on this generation event and juggling. Um, the changes that happen in it every day, as I'm sure you guys all know with, with regulations and different things like that, and just trying to do everything you can to stay on side and do things as, as right as possible. Um, it'll be exciting to kind of open up and free, free up that time to make, to make an impact. And I would like to say the blockchain community, like we talked about at the beginning uh, offline, I guess, um, the industry is growing so quickly and to be able to be involved in it and support other people to get involved and, um, kind of welcome more people in, I think is what's really exciting and, and working with the blockchain users group um, in Canada here, that's kind of my primary goal. How can I support more people to get involved and understand the impact of this technology from, from a more mainstream point of view, I guess, coming from a non-technical background, I get how scary and intimidating that can be, especially when there's big jargony words that sound intimidating. So really just trying to welcome people in and, and make, um, digital inclusion more of a first thought for people 
No, it is. It's, it, I'm telling you, I've never been so professionally satisfied than working in a realm where cooperation dominates. And I, I feel traditional business sometimes leap in in the beginning of conversations and you kind of feel people like doing that, like feeling each other out, saying who's got what, and, blah, blah, blah. and then when you quickly break it down and talk about cooperation, I think everybody wants to get to that space. So I see where you're coming from, where it's really refreshing uh, and it's just amazing to meet people and you don't see a competitor, you see like a partner in everybody. <laughs> and yeah. the ones that get that, you know that they're the best partners, you know, so... I really feel where you're coming from on it and I'm excited for you guys. And wow, that, those are incredible goals that you've already attained. And it looks like the right minds are attacking the right problem. And uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I want to live in a world where right mesh is, is powering uh, lateral sharing and, and things like that. So thanks for your work. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for, for helping me spread the message and, We'll uh, we'll come to you when we need some community support. <laughs> this is yeah. exciting for me. I mean, I literally first got introduced to mesh networks like as a child reading science fiction novels. Um, <laughs> so I was really into like cyberpunk novels and stuff when I was a kid, uh, like Snow Crash and like Neil Stephenson's kind of stuff. And so that's where I first started reading about mesh networks. And I was like, this is going to happen in the future. And now it's happening. Another it's, time. It's <laughs> exactly. So you know, it's just, it's fascinating to see, you know, from the early 90s, you know, the evolution of where we started with the internet to, you know, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, you know, Napster, Kazaa, that whole era. And then, you know, now we've had the mobile era and, you know, we've had all this centralization that took place because it was basically controlled by the ISPs and the wireless carriers. And now we're finally have the tools to break free from that. Um, so it's awesome that uh, you know, Right Mesh is working on that solution. Yeah, gotta empower every single device and connection because we need to fight together to <laughs> break down that centralization. Exactly. Yeah. Well, hey, Melissa, how can people reach you? How can they find you? I am on Twitter at Melissa underscore A Quinn. Um, if not, our, mm, our contact information is all on the Right Mesh website as well. Telegram is always a good place to reach us. We're on there 24 seven. So join the Right Mesh channel. All right. Well, thanks. We appreciate you coming on the show and we've learned a lot and uh, we're excited too. So uh, thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's great to have a conversation about this kind of stuff. Great. Thank you.